Welcome to presentation number 19 in our series, Re-Reading Revelation. We are reading this book again in pursuit of its vision of healing. And <coughs> we have now come to chapter 18. And the title here is Babylon Undone. So <coughs> just by way of review, Revelation tells the story of a cosmic conflict. Much is centered on chapter 12 that influences the story prior to chapter 12 and the story afterwards. So that's the sort of centering of, of the message. And then <coughs> at the end of chapter 12, there is a vision of, uh, of uh, the serpent pursuing the woman into the wilderness. And here in chapter 17 and 18, we have a woman in the wilderness <coughs> seated on, on, uh, on the beast. And that conception is very challenging. What's the relation between the woman that was fleeing and the woman that has now made common cause with the beast? <coughs> And Revelation has said a lot about that in Revelation 17. And now we are in chapter 18 and the story continues. <coughs> we did say that the expose of, the, of, uh, of uh, Babylon could have a literal tenor, that it could refer to a specific city under a coded name. <coughs> I think that is too simplistic. It can have a metaphorical tenor. It's transhistorical with a distinct ideological identity that would be useful. And then <coughs> it has a theological or a biblical tenor. This is the city built by the opposing side in the cosmic conflict. And now it is described, exposed and undone. We're reading in chapter 18. After this I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his splendor. He called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. That's the subject matter. And when an area is illuminated from heaven, it means that the world is getting a revelation. That's what it means. A revelation is taking place, either as expose or as insight in some other way uh, <coughs> about the ways of God. So here in Martin Leonard thing, there is a, a, a light shining on the world and the messenger is barely discernible in the painting. <coughs> Two concepts of fallen could apply here. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. That could mean fallen as finished, terminated, destroyed. Something has come to an end. Or it could be fallen as failed, not yet completely finished, but ripe in the sense that you can say that it was a failure. So Fallen as finished, <coughs> or fallen as failed. And then <coughs> it's probably better to think about it as failed here, even though uh, the, the uh, finished part is, is also coming. <coughs> so let's read on in, in Revelation 18 verses 2 and 3. It has become a dwelling place of demons a haunt of every foul spirit, a haunt of every foul bird, a haunt of every foul and hateful beast. For all the nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxury. So this is an indictment, something is found, or, or Babylon represents negative influences. It, neg it represents a negative constellation. It is really, really bad. 
a place, dwelling place of demons. And just sort of the whole vocabulary of, of awful things are directed against this constellation, the state here of Babylon. Now, the imagery here, even though I say the imagery here describes fallen as failed, here in the Old Testament it is fallen as finished, but this language of the fallen as finished plays over, spills over into the way Revelation describes it. Wild animals <coughs> will lie down there. This is Isaiah's description of Babylon, that uh, a city uh, uh, toward which he was a con contemporary. <coughs> Wild animals will lie down there and its houses will be full of howling creatures, foul spirits, haunt of every foul bird and so on. Uh, <coughs> there ostriches will live and uh, their great demons will dance. And that term, great de uh, goat demons, goat demons will dance, that's a very complicated term to translate. It has something to do with goats, but there, there is a sort of demonic texture to it. <coughs> Hyenas will cry in its towers, and jackals <coughs> in the pleasant palaces. Its time is close at hand, and the days will not be prolonged. So here is the sort of collapse of Babylon more as finished and here may be more as fallen. <coughs> so the angel that illuminates the world with his splendor <coughs> talks or there is talking going on. I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her my people so that you do not have fellowship with her in her sins and so that you do not experience her plagues, for her sins have reached the point of touching heaven, and God has taken note of her iniquities. So this is a call to leave, come out of her, my people. And you might wonder, who is my people? Sort of, is it this person, that person, to God? Who is my people from God's point of view? And the answer must be broad. The answer must be, there is no one. God will not call my people. So God is talking to everyone here, to whom it may concern. It's not a select group. It is broadly, the broad concept of my people. Come out of her, separate. And so in this by this criterion again, we should think of Babylon more from, this, from the point of view of failure and not totally finished. Leave a failed project, a failed constellation, that would be fair to say. <coughs> and the Old Testament texts for the notion of leaving Babylon are quite illuminating, quite amazing. Here is Isaiah, here is Jeremiah. And they devote many chapters to Babylon. These two major prophets in the Old Testament, contemporaries one way or another with the Babylon of history, Jeremiah with the Babylon of King Nebuchadnezzar, they do say things that are relevant and that echo here in Revelation. <clears throat> Go out from Babylon, flee from Chaldea, Declare this with a shout of joy, proclaim it, send it, forth to the, send it forth to the end of the earth, say, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. So God has intervened and is now <coughs> on a mission of liberation from people who are held captive in Babylon. Uh, and then Jeremiah, in those days and at that time, says the Lord, the people of Israel shall come, they and the people of Judah together. They shall come weeping as they seek the Lord their God. So yes, Revelation says my people, and I have said that my people is a broad conception, but it borrows the luster from the Old Testament people of Israel, 
chosen people <coughs> that God gives a call to them. And here they come weeping as they seek the Lord, coming from a state of separation, coming from a state of alienation, and coming back home, as it were. Those are the conceptions we have to think about here. <coughs> and here again in Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 6, my people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray, turning them away on the mountains. From mountain to hill they have gone. They have forgotten their fold. So this is a people, God's people, in a state of homelessness, in a state where they don't know anymore where they belong. They have forgotten their fold, and they have come into this state because the shepherds led them astray. So these are very spiritual conceptions and Revelation is well aware of it and well aware and <coughs> keeping that in mind, come out of her my people, come home. That is the idea. So <coughs> here is a challenging term as we read on in Revelation 18, give her back. Now it is failure, Babylon fallen as failure, but it is also Babylon as a finish that's coming to an end. Because those who have been wronged by Babylon, they are now speaking, give back to her as she herself has given, and double to her double for her deeds. In the cup she mixed, mix double, for she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, so give her a like measure of torment and grief. Now, who is saying this? The best candidate for speaking like this are the ones who have been wronged by Babylon. And the idea, and this is my translation, and it's very literal, <laughs> double to her double. <laughs> In the cup she makes mixed double. That's not right, you know. If it, if it were a <coughs> sort of legal punishment, uh, there we should say <coughs> the punishment should fit the crime. We should not say that we will punish twice as much as the crime. You see, double the, uh, to double it. So I think <coughs> the notion of payback applies here, but it is a figure of speech. <coughs> it is not quantity that is the primary thing. It is certainty. That's how uh, it's better to to talk about it like that. And there are some <coughs> Old Testament passages again that are useful. Here we have uh, one of Jeremiah's Babylon verses. Summon archers against Babylon, all who bend the bow, bow, and camp around her, all around her. Let no one escape. Repay her according to her deeds, just as she has done due to her similar to what we have in Revelation. And then we have a reverse conception of, of the notion of double. Here in Isaiah, speaks tenderly to Jerusalem. Cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is played, that she has received from the Lord, Lord's hand double for her sins. So the, this is a biblical figure of speech the doubling, but it's more in relation to certainty than to quantity. Even though, even though there is a, a, a sort of logic in the Bible that one misdeed, as we try to rectify it, it gets worse. That there is a sort of cycle of violence that, that place and, and, and sort of spills out and gets out of hand. When Cain kills Abel, God does not punish Cain. He puts a mark of protection on Cain's forehead. It's strange to limit the damage done by the initial violent crime. And then later, Lamech, one of the descendants <coughs> of Cain, will say that that if someone violates him, if somebody harms him, he shall be recompensed seven times, you know, seven times as bad as what was done to him. So 
the notion of a sort of mushrooming of violence is built into any violent structure, and maybe Revelation is aware of that. <clears throat> we read on. For in her heart, she says, I rule as a queen. I am no widow, and I will never see grief. Therefore, her plagues will come in a single day, pestilence and mourning and famine, and she will be burned with fire. For mighty is the Lord God who judges her. So all of this, this is a, in passive voice. You know, all these things will come and then it says she will be burned with fire. Who will do it? And the <coughs> illustration here is actually a painting from the German city of Dresden trying to depict the firebombing of Dresden that happened toward the end of World War II. That was just a, a, a conflagration the like of which no one has ever seen in the history of humanity, maybe with the exception of Hiroshima. So she will be burned with fire. You know, these things that even in our time we have some, some ideas how it might look. <coughs> so burned with fire. Her plagues will come in a single day, pestilence and mourning and famine, and she will be burned with fire. We'd like to know who is doing it. We'd like to know who's doing it. And we read in chapter 17, and the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the whore. They will make her desolate and naked. They will devour her flesh, and they will burn her with fire. Something is happening inside the structure that the Revelation calls Babylon to make self-destruction seem like the better way to explain what is happening here. <clears throat> and we read on. <clears throat> and the kings of the earth who committed sexual immo immorality and lived it up with her, they will weep and mourn inconsolably over her when they see the smoke of her burning. So more burning here. Far off they will stand, petrified at her torment, saying, How awful, how awful, the great city, Babylon, the strong city. For in one hour your moment of truth has come. So here Babylon falls apart. It comes, it comes undone. And this illustration here is quite a good illustration. Here they stand far off, sort of trying to create a sense of distance that is really quite imaginary because the structure that falls and the structure they mourn is also a structure of which they are a part. They have been part of it. They have been sort of uh, uh, participants in building it, uh, it up. But this is illustration is taken from the Luther, the Luther Bible from 1534 when someone made this wonderful illustration of the fall of Babylon here and here with a millstone that we will read about in a moment. <coughs> There is a connection in these texts between trade and theology. It's very amazing. Trading, commerce, economics, but there is a theological tenor to it that we must not miss. And here with another illustration, and this is what we read. And the merchants of the earth, merchants trade. <coughs> They weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk and scarlet, all kinds of scented wood, all articles of ivory, all articles of costly wood, bronze, iron and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, olive oil, choice, flour and wheat, cattle and sheep horses and chariots, slaves, and human lives. So this, this is a list of luxury goods, and someone has said that these are items that no one needs and few can afford. It's quite true. Maybe these are not items of need, they are items of luxury that certainly few can afford them. So this is a, something is falling apart here 
and it is and it is described from the point of view of those who had the privileges and then <coughs> after these luxury items after these items of commerce commodities there is also human beings as a commodity and being sold and here they are mourning here and this scene and here i just want to throw in not as a digression necessarily, but as a proof of concept, as it were. And this amazing book by Edward Baptist, The Half Has Never Been Told, Slavery and the Making of American Capitalism. I'd say it's a must-read book. <coughs> Just to prove that human beings have been used as commodities and have been items of trade, millions of them, taken against their wishes from Africa and sold as slaves and separated family separation, mother from daughter and so on in an exceedingly cruel thing. The hurt or the oppression of the many for the benefit of the few, for the enrichment of the few. <coughs> so trade and theology here, we're still in the same uh, verse here, horses and chariots, slaves and human lives. <coughs> and here, what sort of the, the theology here, the text in the Old Testament that is probably the one that is most helpful <coughs> for the background <coughs> is Ezekiel chapter 28, where uh, Ezekiel describes the demise of the of Tyre, the prince of Tyre, <coughs> and Tyre was a trading nation. It was a city-state in the Mediterranean that built itself up very much on trade in, 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 the, in the Mediterranean world. But it also serves as a symbol of the evil one, who was an illustrious being and who traded. <coughs> but the trade, his trade was Theology, you were without fault in your ways from the day you were created till malice was found in you by the abundance of your trade, of your trading in slander. You became filled with violence and you lost the way. Here is the fall of this figure, the covering cherub, this amazing creature who <coughs> somehow loses his way and who trades in slander. And so these goods here that are so material, I am not going to say that we should take out of it the economics, the material aspects, but we should not forget that behind it lies another type of trade, theological trade, trade in slander, trade in misrepresentation of God. <coughs> and <coughs> Here again, <coughs> Revelation 18.14, And the fruit which you desired has slipped from you, and all your brightness and all your splendor are lost to you, never to be found again. It's hard to read this without hearing this sort of, <coughs> at least some whispered echo of the story of the covering cherub. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, carnelian, chrysolite, and moonstone, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald, and worked in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared, this beautiful thing, beautiful being here. And then by the <coughs> multitude of your iniquities in the unrighteousness of your trade in slander, you profaned your sanctuaries. And then he comes to an end. So I brought out fire from within you. It consumed you. And I turned you to ashes on the earth in the sight of all who saw you. So here this <coughs> description echoes somewhat in Revelation and he comes to an end by fire coming from within him. He is not destroyed from without. He is destroyed from within. And this is a very important conception here in Revelation. <coughs> Crocodile tears. 
the merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her will stand afar off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas, the great city clothed in fine linen in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with per jewels and with pearls. For in one hour all this wealth has been laid waste. They are crying, but I'm calling it crocodile tears because they were participants in building up this structure. And when the structure falls, it is also something that reverberates on them. Now they want to stand, keep distance. What is it? And they stand off, they will stand far off. <laughs> but you, the distance means, oh, this is something we, we want to make sure that no one incriminates us. It doesn't work quite that way. And <coughs> it continues, we read on and on, and it is more here a uh, description of economic collapse. Then <coughs> all shipmasters and seafarers, sailors and all, who trade, all whose trade is on the sea stood afar off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning, again more burning. What city was like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads here as they wept and mourned, crying out, alas, alas, the great city where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth, for in one hour she has been laid waste. So Babylon has fallen apart. And there is a depiction of economic collapse here. Uh, and then a very intriguing sentence. Rejoice over her heaven and the believers and the apostles and the prophets, for God has decided for you from her. I have translated the text very literal, liter literally for a reason, but even a literal translation is hard to convey the import of it. So let us try first by a quotation from my commentary. In plainer English, God has not brought judgment against Babylon with a direct hit from on high but has accomplished something far more difficult at the level of imagination, cost and execution. The judgment came out of her, making her be the case, uh, case against herself. So that's sort of evidentiary thing. But it is a little more pointed than that. Even what I wrote in my commentary falls a bit short from her is not only a matter of evidence and verdict, but also of execution. Babylon will herself execute the verdict. Think about that. That's amazing. And so just to drive home that point that she will, Babylon will herself execute the verdict and sort of do herself in. There, here we have these texts that that uh, the plagues will come in a single day, pestilence and mourning and famine, and she will be burned with fire. And this other text, that the fire that burns up Babylon will arise from within. They will devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. It is quite important to keep this in balance and get this matter straight. So, <coughs> uh, I show this illustration here in the previous presentation that <coughs> the purpose of the bad side, the opposing side, and God's purpose are actually coming together, conflating, conflated. God has given it into their hearts to carry out God's purpose and bring about one single purpose, to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be brought to completion. There is a plan A. It is the plan of the devil, the plan of Satan. And there is a plan B. It is the same plan. It is God's plan because God will bring Satan to an end by allowing Satan to carry out his plan. It is a plan doomed to fail. And God knows that and can do it. <coughs> so we're reaching the end of the chapter here. And <coughs> there are a few more things that we should explore before we let go. 
Babylon is thrown down. A mighty angel took a stone like a great millstone here and threw it into the sea here, saying with such violent force, Babylon, the great city, will be thrown down and will be found no more. The Greek word here is ballo. It is a very big word in New Testament theology. It is a very big verb in the book of Revelation because when the cosmic conflict begins in heaven and the ancient serpent is thrown down, it's the word ballo. He is thrown down. So what is thrown down here is not just some small thing in history. It is a sort of, it's the completion, the expulsion, the expose of the evil forces and it will be no more. That is the <coughs> image here. It is a picture of finality. And then there is eerie silence in Revelation and the cadence of this passage is quite amazing. The sound of harpists and musicians and flutists and trumpeters will be heard in you no more. And traders of any trade will be found in you no more. And the sound of the millstone will be heard in you no more. And the light of a lamp will shine in you no more. And the voice of bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. No more. No more. No more. Just silence desolation. It has come to an end. The failed city is now also a finished city. That's what is depicted. But the failed city is depicted in terms once used in the Old Testament by the prophet Jeremiah about Jerusalem, about the good city. And I will banish from them the sound of mirth and the sound of gladness the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstone and the light of their lamp. So this is the text echoing here about Babylon, once used about Jerusalem. <laughs> well, <coughs> there is a counterpoint. <laughs> there will be harps in that other city that is depicted, the lamb standing on Mount, Mount Zion and those with harps in that other city that we will read about later, the New Jerusalem. <clears throat> so now to take a step back from these conceptions, from this narrative that began in chapter 12, the dragon pursuing the woman into the wilderness and pouring water after her, and then uh, the concept of may be succeeding somewhat in reaching the woman who in later in Revelation will be seated on many waters and be seated on the back of the beast. <coughs> so here I'm digressing now into history. And I want to read a statement from Lord Acton, who was a Roman Catholic uh, church historian in uh, the UK and uh, in Britain. Uh, toward the end of the <coughs> of the 19th, uh, let's see, toward the end of the 19th century. <coughs> and he writes in a book that I treasure, if I have to escape with only 10 books in my library, I would probably take along Lord Acton's book, uh, Essays in Freedom and Power. He writes, if I, if I, I may employ an expressive anachronism, the vice of the classic state was that it was both church and state in one. Morality was undistinguished from religion and politics from morals. And in religion, morality and politics, there was only one legislator and one authority. He calls that constellation the vice of the classic state. Religion and politics conflated. Only one authority that was the central authority for politics and religion. He calls it vice. Well, 
if that is the vice of the classic state, it will also be the vice of the Christian state. Morality and politics in one. One in religion, morality and politics, there was only one legislator and one authority. And that is the essence of the Constantinian state as much as for the classic state and in the Christian conception. And I hope you will not get offended at my next illustration. Uh, it is not the main point and it should not be uh, overemphasized, <coughs> but this picture is very similar. This president of a very uh, well-known country and a very well-known recent president posing with the Bible is a Constantinian conception of power. It's a Constantinian conception where politics harnesses religion for its purpose. In some ways, politics held hostage to religion. In some ways, religion, maybe more importantly, held hostage to politics. All I'm saying here, the vice of the classic state, church and state in one, the vice of the Constantinian conception, church and state in one. And you get the point. Let's <coughs> look at this even more broadly. So <coughs> here is cross and empire as conceptions at their point of inception, at the point of beginning. And this is, uh, is uh, Raphael's depiction of Constantine, the Emperor Constantine here. I can <coughs> draw him here like this, Emperor Constantine here, uh, having his vision of the, of the cross. And here is the vision of the cross and the message he gets that is by this cross, by this sign you will be victorious. So here the empire takes into itself the Christian religion, the woman as it were, the woman in our revelation story, and makes her an instrument toward its end and a servant of its end. And just to see how this was implemented at the level of symbols, we're now in Istanbul, Constantinople, the city built by the Emperor Constantine uh, in, in the Eastern Empire. And here is this column still standing. I'm so happy I have seen it. I really wanted to see it badly. Maybe at its, hi at its height it was about 50 meters high. It was enormous. It's still very high. At the top of this column there was a statue of the Emperor Constantine looking like the god Apollo. And on his head he had the nails. His mother, Helena, it is said that she had gone to Jerusalem and she had retrieved the nails that was used in the crucifixion of Jesus. And Constantine, statue here on the top here, he had the nails into his head like a crown. So the emperor is now crowned with the nails used for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The symbolism of church and state coming together now as a Christian state is quite powerful. It's quite D difficult to dismiss it. Certainly not easy to dismiss it when you read a book like Revelation. Here we are in Rome. We're just off the Roman Forum and the Imperial Forum. They are very close. And here is, I think this is the column of Trajan. So once, many, many centuries ago, the Roman Emperor Trajan was standing on top of that column here. And guess who is standing there now? Well, I have a close-up. You see here, the person standing on top of Trajan's column now is the Apostle Peter, with the book, yes, and with the keys to the kingdom. So this, these are unambiguous symbols of church and empire coming together as though they have shared interest as though the interest of one transmutes into the interest of the other. And <clears throat> just to take it into Reformation times, the premise of the Reformation was that this was not a good idea. 
that that joining together was not a good idea, even though Reform Reformation itself couldn't quite, uh, couldn't quite do away with it. Here, this is Lukas Cranach, who was a, an assistant or the artist uh, uh, who made things happen in the relation to Luther and Wittenberg. And here he has the passion of Christ. Christ is crowned with a crown of thorns. And here he talks about the Roman Pope who is crowned with a, another type of crown. L loss or lack of secular power here. And lots and lots of secular power in the other image. These are cartoons, but they were extremely effective to convey certain things for the Reformation. Here, Christ is driving out the money changers from the temple. And here, the church welcomes the money lenders and the money changers into the temple, as it were. So these are just... <coughs> just fleeting images looking at history and looking to see if Revelation's thing about the woman who fled the beast, the state, the power, that something might have just gone wrong on the way. And there is some historical evidence for that. A couple of images since Revelation 18 is so concerned about economic predation, about trade, commerce, even if we say that it is theological and trade in slander. Let's look at this one. And I'm again quoting from my favorite author, uh, Sir Harold Acton. French historians believe that in a single generation, six million people, six million of people died of want. Six million French people died of starvation during uh, for, uh, just one generation. It would be easy to find tyrants more violent, more malignant, more odious than Louis XIV, this one. But there was not one who ever used his power to inflict greater suffering or greater wrong. And the admiration with, with, with which he inspired the most illustrious men of his time, denotes the lowest depth of which the turpitude of absolutism has ever degraded the conscience of Europe. What's this? It means that this extremely Christian you know, monarch, uh, uh, he is an agent of oppression, and six million French people die of starvation, and he still succeeds in being widely admired and still today may be even celebrated. I'm going to play the story of colonialism here. It takes one minute. What's the point? The point is that <coughs> Christian Europe launches a, a, uh, an expansionist scheme, launches a scheme of expansion, commerce, exploitation, oppression on the world. And you can say, well, there was also Christian mission, but there was Christian commerce that was driving it, and it was exploitatory. It wasn't <coughs> very pretty. And Babylon's economic indictment or the economic, the, in, the 
indictment of Babylonian economics in Revelation 18 makes it tempting to think about that story when we read Revelation. That's what I'm saying. And here <coughs> people admire Starbucks and they have great coffee, but they also pay the farmers very poorly. It is a predatory system. For, uh, and here, Babylon and ecological degradation. I could talk for an hour about it, or 10 hours, too, about what is happening ecologically in the world because of economic interests prevailing over interests of sustainability and care. And that, too, would fit in the horizon of the book of Revelation. Or <coughs> we could talk about this. I'll just give you the illustration on, on, on this side, <coughs> what is called the hourglass shape of the world food system, where at one end of the hourglass here, you have producers, farmers. At the other end, you have consumers. And the farmers are hurting. And the consumers are being hurt because they are fed foods that are harmful, that are not good for them. And at the middle of the hourglass here, you have the corporations that are huge economic beneficiaries of a system that ultimately, that ultimately is harmful and that ultimately is unsustainable. It will fail, maybe much like Failure is depicted in the book of Revelation, and the traders are standing there and mourning that it collapsed. <coughs> and you have this one too about the 1%, how the trend here is that the top 1% now commanding about 40% of the wealth, and the bottom 90% now with 20% left to them. It's not a good system. It's not sustainable. And is it under the indictment, this, this sort of commercial economic critique of Revelation 18 apply? Maybe it does. Well, leave that aside. Let's go to one thing that really does apply, that is a sort of bottom line. Forget about everything else. Let's read this one. <coughs> And in you was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all who have been killed with violence on the earth. This conception of Babylon is broad because you cannot blame the Roman Empire for everyone who died. So Roman imperial application is too narrow. You cannot blame any other sort of Roman constellation, not even church history for those who died, because it, it's everyone here, all who have been killed with violence, are now found in this structure called Babylon. So this requires a trans-historical broad element, and it also requires that we think about the cosmic rebel who posed as a good influence and who turned out to be violent, that the forensic examination found dead bodies where he had been operating. We found evidence of violence and that is the bottom line of indictment, the, that violence, whatever the reason was for it. So in you was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all who have been killed with violence on the earth. That is a crime that really counts. And I would close with a quotation from Roger Williams and apply it to the sin or the fall of Babylon, who says that an enforced uniformity of religion throughout their nation or civil state confounds the civil and religious, church and state, denies the principles of Christianity and civility, and denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. To the extent that history shows us structures that made the woman participate in structures of oppression, including taking the lives of others for whatever their beliefs were, to that extent we have 
a denial that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and in some ways examples of the story told about Babylon in the book of Revelation.